We're going to get our, our PowerPoint up. The, power, the, new, the new PowerPoint will be on the internet. Sometime tomorrow morning. Uh, Brother Bill will get uh, that one loaded up. Um, we, it, it looks the same as you start out because what we're doing is as we, um, as we update this, and, as, and of course as we're going through the study, I'm updating it and adding new slides and so forth. And so um, he will go out and take what we, the new one I put out here tonight in the, in the audio room, he'll, he'll upload it out to the, uh, the website, and so you can go look at it on the website, all right? So if you're listening to the sermon or whatever, you can get the PowerPoint up and listen to it and, and go through the PowerPoint at the same time. Now, the PowerPoint is not excessively detailed. It, it is good information and stuff that, you know, particular things you don't have time to write down, you know, all the key points or the, uh, everything. So uh, it, is, it is good for you. It's good there. And, and, of course, obviously you can save it. They can right-click and save it onto their own computer, can't they? You can right click, save it onto your own computer, and have a copy on yours. And of course, it'll be keep keep getting updated. Um, so, it's been a couple of weeks. Obviously, last sun, last Wednesday, what was everybody doing? Well, let me tell you what I was doing. Um, my um, son was at school. They were supposed to dismiss at three, and at two thirty, the they were supposed to have a performance Friday and Saturday night. And so the guy in charge of jazz band came to him and said, look, I wouldn't ask you all to do this, but it's really important that we practice. So they start practicing at 3.30. Well, I leave the house at 2.45. It takes me till 3.30 to get to Greensboro College because of the traffic and everybody pulling all over. Then it takes us over an hour to get home. And not because I was spinning out, because every other uh, yin-yang in the world was spinning out. You know, listen, you know, I, 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 I rub on, we're watching trucks. You know, everybody got to have a truck. Well, unless you got a four-wheel drive truck, they don't work. Unless you put about four, uh, two tons in your, in your rear end, you know. They're, 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 the trucks are fishtailing all over the place. They're spinning down on hills, causing all kinds of, I mean, people are everywhere. So it took me over two hours to go from my house to Greensboro College to pick him up and come home because he couldn't drive his car home. We weren't going to have him driving, you know, Betsy. <laughs> He'd have been probably one of the people inside the road somewhere. Hallelujah. So anyway, so let's kind of, let's, so we're going to pick back up. And, let's, and if you haven't been with us since we started this teaching, I do encourage you, go back. And it started um, in, in, in uh, January. <coughs> 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 excuse me, on the life and writings of Paul, a chronological study of his life and epistles. Now, here's what we're doing. Um, and until we run out of the book of Acts, in other words, there's going to be a point where we're, we're done with the book of Acts and Paul's still going on, okay? But we're going through the book of Acts. We're tracing his missionary journeys, first and second. We're about, we're going to wrap a second up real quick, because we've already kind of read this, but we, you know, we left him in Corinth writing first and second Thessalonians. So we've got to get him out of Corinth back to uh, Antioch. All right, and then from there he'll start on his, his third missionary journey. And, um, and so what we're doing is we're going through his life, and when we get to the stage of his life where he writes an epistle, we stop and we do a study on that epistle or letter, okay? Um, and so like last, last time we were together, uh, we finished Second Thessalonians because he was at Corinth, and at Corinth he wrote both First and, first and Second Thessalonians on his second missionary journey. On his third missionary journey, he writes First and Second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians. Okay, he writes all those letters on, on there uh, in, in that on that missionary journey. And so, um, you know, this is the chrono chronological state, not your biblical can uh, canic canon order. It is the chronological order of things. So we left off um, last time. Are we ready? Yeah, we're obviously ready. You got it up there. Let's go get the map. Okay. Back to the one that has the, um, the uh, second missionary journey, that slide. Okay? We have the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. We, we, he, right here in Corinth, he wrote his, now, now some scholars will say he wrote in Athens, Corinth, but you can see that's kind of like Greensboro and Winston-Salem. You know, we're, we're 2,000 years down the road. If we're 20 miles off of where he wrote it, okay, all right? But, you know, so it just depends on who you're studying behind, you know, and listen, scholars are all, you know, they, they all, always want to be right, you know. But we're in the ballpark, okay? Uh, around 52 A.D., all right? So Paul's in Corinth. 
he, he's right here. Now he will leave Corinth after he writes first and second Thessalonians and leave go to Ephesus and then sail to Caesarea, Jerusalem, and back up to Antioch. And that's kind of where we are. We're just going to kind of get through this. We already read this, but um, let's go ahead and pick up. Um, yeah, let's, we'll just pick up in chapter 18, verse 1, all right? 20, 22 is when he finishes this, this second missionary journey. Um, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come to Italy with his wife Priscilla. You've heard of Aquila and Priscilla, haven't you? Uh, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So here we have Aquila and Priscilla leaving Rome because they've been ordered by Claudius to leave as a Jew. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation, they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pa uh, pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, Paul spent, as we said, about 18 months in Corneth, all right, about a year and a half in Corneth. And it's during this time, now, let's, let's kind of bring it back up to date. Remember, Paul had been in Thessalonica. Paul had started, there, there had been a church started in Thessalonica. That, that's up, uh, <laughs> I don't have my. My pointer, wait, that's, I need, I need a, a, a little smaller pointer, I think. Paul had been in Thessalonica, started a church, had a move of God, Jews got upset, came in, started up some trouble, ran into Berea, they followed him into Berea, and so he left, went down to Athens, and then moved over to Corinth, and at Corinth he spends about 18 months. Concerned about the local church there in, in Thessalonica, since Timothy back from Athens, Timothy comes and brings the state, he sends, he sends a letter to this young church about six months after he was there, and that's where we study First Thessalonians to cover the things there. And then about three months later, he writes Second Thessalonians, okay? And then, and then so here we are, uh, and he's, he's in Corinth, and he's done these things, and verse 6, when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he took his raiment and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go into the Gentiles. He departed thence, entered into a man's house named Justice, and one that worshiped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. Like we said, that man, it was attached to it. And uh, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house, and many other Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night, by a vision, be not afraid, but speak, speak and hold not in thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months. That's where we get the 18 months from. Hallelujah. Teaching the word among them. When, and when Galilee was a deputy uh, of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong, or, or wicked lewdness, uh, lewdness, O ye Jews, reason that I which shall bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names of your law, look you to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And when all the, um, when all the Greeks took Sosithus, <laughs> the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared for none of these things. Now the Jews got ticked off and beat the guy. Well, I like these guys. Mess with our guy, we'll beat you. <laughs> my, my kind of Christians. Manly Christians. All right. It's a joke. But it does add some, some wondering to, you know, this, this sloppy. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. And he came to Ephesus. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And Paul, verse 18, after this, tarried there a yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence unto Syria with Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Chentria, uh, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. Now, so here's how Paul, Aquila and Priscilla end up in Ephesus. Paul sails, Paul sails from Corneth over, uh, over to Ephesus, just, just across there, the, uh, you know, right here across this little opening in the... In the uh, I'm not sure what sea this is. The great sea is down here, but up in here. Sells from Corinth over to Ephesus right here. And Paul, Aquila and Priscilla go with him, and he just leaves them there. You know, now I don't mean that in a bad way. He left them there uh, so he could go on uh, and do certain other things. Um, and he came to Ephesus, left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Um, but I will return unto you if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. So we see him sailing from Ephesus, and he sails over to where? Caesarea. And, and when he had landed at Caesarea, he had gone up and saluted the church and went down. Now, I love this. They went down to Antioch. That's this way. <laughs> okay? 
went down to Antioch right there. All right? Okay. And so this, he gone and slew the church, and he went down to Antioch. And after, okay, now this is, this is the end of a second journey. So Paul uh, has finished his second missionary journey. He started about uh, 49 A.D., finished his about three-year journey from here, across here, back up, all through here. We spent a year and a half in Corinth, Corinth and then over to Ephesus and down and back up. So all together, he was gone about three years from the church of Antioch. Now, wait, what had happened in Antioch? There were in the church of Antioch certain apostles and prophets and teachers, such as, you know, uh, Barnabas and Paul and, and so forth and so on, and Saul and so on. And the Holy Ghost, as they ministered to the Holy Ghost and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. They were sent out from that church. Okay? So that's their home base. They keep going back to their home base. Notice this? They keep going back to their home base. You know, ministers, you, you know, ministers need to realize you need a home base. Even if you're traveling, you're going out, you need, a, you need a pastor, you need a home base. And, and even Paul, who wrote so much of the Bible, kept going back to his home base. Okay? And then on his third missionary journey, he finishes up and meets with James, the head of the church, and, and the elders there, and they discuss different things. So it, it's just, you know, we, we find out that there, there are no lone rangers in the kingdom. Amen? Uh, you know, they, they, they would go and they would... Uh, they would get together they would discuss things uh they would talk about doctrines they would talk about things going on in the church and then they would get together and they would come up with a slew and like in one case they said you know to keep them telling them to stain from meats with blood and this kind of thing and you know they, they all kind of agreed to that and they all went their way but they, you know they had met and discussed doctrinal things and so it's important that we have the covering even if you're a minister everybody say amen all right Praise the Lord. I was listening to Pastor Hagen last night. I'll tell you, he, he was on a roll this week. I mean, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, he preached on the word, the blood, and being led by the Spirit. That's for three pretty good subjects. <laughs> staying with the word, amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. Staying under the blood, and then staying and being led by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So anyway, and so now Paul's back in, in Antioch for a short season. Um, He's only there for a little while, and it says here in verse 23, and after he spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, so what he does, he gets back to Antioch. Oh, gosh. No, I don't want to do that. Please wait. Okay. That's why I need to give me a different one. So he's here in Antioch, and, and now here is, uh, where is Phrygia? I'm looking for it. I can't. Uh, there it is right there. Okay, and with those, uh, Galatia, here's the region. So these, this region here is Phrygia and Galatia. Paul's here in Antioch, so he goes back through Tarsus, uh, through Derby, Iconium, and then, uh, and I'm sorry, this is, starts his, next, next map, I'm sorry, next map, right below, next slide, goes to his third missionary journey. Yeah, just the next, just the next one. Hallelujah. There we go. He leaves Antioch, goes to Tarsus, Derby, Iconium, Antioch, the other Antioch, and then shoots over to Ephesus. Ephesus has become a very important part in, in the ministry of Paul and in the kingdom of God. Okay? And so uh, Paul starts on his third mission trip. And he, um, so let's start here in verse 23, 24. He departed uh, after some time, went through the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order. That means he went back to these same cities that he had done before. Um, what's he doing? Strengthening the disciples. See, Paul's, Paul's calling, and, and honestly, minister's callings, are not just, you know, to tickle your ears and make you feel good. It is to strengthen you in, remember we talked about Sunday, the difference between just the, the prayer of believing and receiving, we call a prayer of faith, which is a believing and receiving, but also the word fa faith, paistis, means to have faith in God. You know, have faith, confidence, reliance, trust in God, so you can use the faith of God. We need to be strengthened. Now, in strengthening, you know, it takes correction, it takes instruction, it takes uh, teaching, and, um, you know, and reproof. It takes all those things. Remember, the Word of God is profitable for all those things. And so, in order to strengthen someone, we have to have all this. So, Paul would go through and do all this. And as a matter of fact, when we get to the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, they are extremely corrective letters. They are. Now, you get to Galatians, and it's more, of a, it's more of a doctrinal letter, and I'll tell you why when we get to it. You want a little hint? There is the belief that the, church, that the letter to Galatia and the letter to Ephesus were circular letters 
written that traveled throughout those regions. And so they weren't necessarily, in some cases, specifically addressing what was going on in a local church as much as general doctrine and general uh, exhortations. Okay? First Corinthians, Second Corinthians are, are written to stuff that's going on at Corinth. And we learn a lot from that because we see the insight. And there, there's also the belief that there were four letters to Corinth. We only have two of them. They believe, in other words, they believe there's a letter before the first and one in between first and second. Okay? And some of the internal evidence is kind of, you could see, well, yeah, I could see that. You know, you could, you could kind of get that. We don't know for sure. We don't have them, so we can't say for sure. But there is, there is a, a tendency to believe that that actually is true. We don't know it for a fact. Um, there's some references made that kind of lean that way. But since we don't have them, say la vie. All right? But they are, they are you know, and, and when we get to teaching on that, you'll find out why. We may or may not get into 1 Corinthians. I'm not sure that we're going to get that far. <clears throat> I mean, we're not too far down the road from getting there. But, all right. So, uh, he went through and was strengthening. Uh, he went through them in order. <laughs> Let me find where I am. Hallelujah. Yeah, strengthening all the disciples. In other words, come, he's come to strengthen them. Now listen, you know, we, 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 we want you to be strong, so you're great. We, you love the Lord. You're, God's your God. He's on the inside of you now. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. Now don't do that. Now do this. Praise God. But you know, you guys are awesome. Jesus is on the inside of you. He's going to be your helper like we talked on Sunday morning two weeks ago, uh, Sunday week ago, how the Holy Ghost is on the inside of us. Amen. And we, we, can, we got the one who can take hold together with against our infirmities. He has to take hold together with against. You don't do him. He doesn't do it by yourself. He's not the doer. He's the helper. Amen. And so in strengthening, all these things come into play. And then he goes on next. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent, and, uh, uh, learn, uh, eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently uh, the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So now we have somebody who, who knows about Jesus. He's coming and teaching. But as far as baptism, he only knows about John's baptism under repentance, the baptism of water. But he's found out he's, he's gotten born again. So he's, he's preaching Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the Messiah, but he doesn't know anything else beyond that. And um, when he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto him and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In other words, they said, hey, look, you, you're, you're on fire, you got this, but there's more. Amen? Uh, for, it, for he mightily, uh, see, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting him and the, the uh, exhorting, uh, exhorting, exhorting, and the, I'm sorry, I, what I have, I have a different Bible tonight, and it's got ASV stuff in there, and I keep running into it. I'm trying to read over top of it. Um, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and publicly showed by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So here we have a guy. So, so um, you know, Paul, Paul's out, you know, in, in Galatia and Phygia. And over here in Apollos, remember, who's over, in, who's over in Ephesus? Aquila and Priscilla. This Apollos comes down into Ephesus, and he's preaching Jesus is the Christ. They're having, I mean, he's getting stuff done. And they hear it. They praise God. He's got it. But, hey, God, there's more. Since the Bible made it clear he only knew the baptism of John, he was probably taking him out and doing the baptism that John was doing. I baptize you under repentance. Jesus is the Christ. That's what he knew. You know, God will use you with what you know. Amen. Now, he wants you to know more, but he will use you where you are. Just have a good heart and have a willing heart and be on fire. You know, that's obviously he's on fire for the Lord, walking in all the light he has and on fire for Jesus. Amen. Praise God for that. When I, now, notice that Aquila and Priscilla didn't go, well, you know, like, we're just so excited you're on fire going your way. No, they said they showed in the way more perfectly. In other words, hey, man, you have got it. You got a fire. You got a zeal. But there's more to it. Here, we're going to help you out. Praise God. That's because we all should want to grow. Isn't that right? All right. And it came to pass while Apollos was at Corneth. So in other words, now he, obviously he takes off and goes over to Corneth from Ephesus. And again, that's not that big of a deal, is it? Here's Ephesus, and my own Ephesus, right there, Corinth's over here. So Apollos has come over here, got the way shown to him more perfectly. He takes off to Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, so Ephesus up in the upper, above Ephesus, and finding certain disciples. Who disciples? Whose disciples? Apollos's. 
Paul comes along. Now, so Paul has come down preaching, gets down to Ephesus. Aquila and Priscilla hear him. They expound him the way he wants perfectly. He takes off, runs over to Corinth. Paul shows up coming on his journey from Antioch, and he's in the upper coast of Ephesus, and he finds disciples, most likely Apollos' disciples. And he has a question for him. You see, remember, Apollos is only teaching the baptism of John. That's all he knew. That was at the time that he got all those folks saved. That's all he knew. Amen? Now let me say this. We can't limit ourselves to one revelation. Because there's more. There's more than faith. There's more than grace. There's more than love. There's more than righteousness. Some people don't like it, but there is holiness. Amen? There is good works. There's, there is uh, denying yourself. There is, there is keeping yourself under. There's all kinds of things the Bible teaches, and we can't be limited to one doctrine or one revelation. We need the whole. Because the whole makes the whole. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You know, one piece of pie is good, but the whole pie is better. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you know, the other, other day, me and Janie on Valentine's Day, we were going to go out, you know, it was, it, it was kind of a duddy, but, you know, it, it wasn't a real special Valentine's Day. You could just kind of, one of those things, snow, you couldn't get out. You, you tried to go out and do something, and every restaurant in the world was full of was, uh, cabin fever people using Valentine's Day as an excuse to get out of the house, and a Friday night at that. I mean, we just drove into the Palladium parking lot and drove right back out. I ain't going in there anymore. Because we won't go. There's a, there's a dessert place over there <coughs> next to the Greek place. It's supposed to be really good. The kids told us about it. So we were going to go, oh, we're going to get a nice dessert. So we, we, had, we drove around a few places trying to find some place we could get a nice little dessert. Couldn't do it. Everybody was crazy. Jane says, take me home. She said, but do you want to go by the grocery store first and do our old treat? Now, one of the things that always, we've always done just about the whole time we've been married is get like a Sara Lee New York style cheesecake and then to get a can of cherry pie filling and then take that bad boy and open it up and just put the whole can on there. Now I don't put all the, I don't put all the syrup stuff in there, but most of it. But anyway, and, uh, and then cut it and eat it. Eat ba 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 ka sa ta ba 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 glory to God. Make you shout. We don't do it often. I mean, that's the first time we've done that. In probably a year. But we did it. Who? Yeah. That was, so anyway. How come I got off on that? Anybody remember what I was talking about before I got off on that? Oh. So we cut out our pieces. Let me tell you something. There was still three-fourths of it left. I'm so, much, I'm so glad we did that. Instead of going to the store. And now you can know you can go to the store now and buy just a slice. Little, little Edwards things. Little slices of whatever. You know, and you come on, you get one little slice. That's for those of you who can't control yourself. <laughs> that would be okay. I get the other one because I don't care if I control myself on that deal. I'm going to think, I'm going to get all I want. All right? But you know what? I found out that the whole was a little bit different than just a little bit. Amen? And the same is true with the Word of God. The whole is better than this slice by itself, or this slice by itself, or this. Now, all those slices are good, but when you put it all together, you get the whole picture. Okay? All right. So we have here, we have some disciples up here on the upper coast of Ephesus right up here who've gotten apart. Jesus is the Messiah, and they were baptized and under John's baptism. Well, that's good. They're going to heaven. But even when, when Apollos got down and Aquila and Priscilla found him, they expounded to him the way the more perfectly, he takes off to Corneth. And he probably said, whoa, Corneth needs this. They need more than they're getting, you know, they're, that's, that's, that, that's, that city's a mess. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> and uh, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, most likely Apollos. He said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we ain't even heard the Holy Ghost. I'm going to paraphrase a bit. We hadn't even heard of the Holy Ghost. So Paul says, well, unto what? Well, then were you baptized? And they said, in the John's baptism. Why, why did he say that? Then you got a lot of people who say, were you baptized in the name of Jesus only? Then you got big, you got whole denominations. That you, that if you're not born again, speaking in tongues, and baptized in the name of Jesus only, you're not saved. 
Isn't it interesting that Jesus had baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and when the disciples at Ephesus, when Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed, they said we hadn't heard of the Holy Ghost, and John's, Paul's first question is, well, how were you baptized? They said in the John's. Because see, Paul knew if they'd been baptized according to the Lord's ordinance, they would have heard of the Holy Ghost. So that kind of does with that other doctrine in Jesus' name only. You make a big deal out of it, make a whole denomination out of it. Make, I mean, people ain't going to, you ain't going, if you weren't baptized in the name of Jesus only, you ain't even saved. Well, Paul wanted to know why, how they couldn't have heard of the Holy Ghost. They said we were baptized in the John's baptism. Okay. Now, it's interesting also, you got people who say that when you get born again, you get all the Holy Ghost you're going to get. And Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Well, they couldn't have gotten all the Holy Ghost you're going to get when you get born again. If Paul asked believers who were disciples who've been baptized in the John's baptism, how are you baptized? And asked them the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that right there fixes a lot of stupid doctrine. Yeah. Just, just by itself. One scripture, boom. Knock it in the head. Hallelujah. Let's move on. Amen? Because... You need to read the Bible without religious glasses on and without preconceived ideas. You know, we say this, you know, the Bible should create your narrative, not you create a narrative and make the Bible prove it. Amen? They said unto John's baptism. Paul says, well, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him who has come after him, that is on Christ. Amen? And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul lays hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. Now, wait a second now. Now, we, we could go, you know, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but obviously he had to say, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, because that's part of what he was teaching. He, they couldn't, he couldn't believe they weren't baptized. They didn't have to heard of the Holy Ghost if they'd been baptized in the right way. But then he says this. When he lays hands on them after they're, after they're baptized in Jesus' name, or baptism, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I like what Dad Hagen said. He says, I always do this. I say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He just covered all the bases. Everybody got it. <laughs> Amen. He laid hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them. Right? That means they're born again. They're baptized properly now. They're saved. And after this, the Holy Ghost comes on them. How could that be if you got all the Holy Ghost you're going to get when you got saved? Because... There's more. There's more. Everybody say, there's more. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So we had about 12 disciples there. He shows up. They hadn't heard of the Holy Ghost. Paul explains it to them. They get baptized right. Lays hands on them. They get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Start speaking in tongues and prophesying. And everywhere that there is, a, there is an account of something actually taking place when they got baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues is part of it. Amen. Now, obviously, Paul thought it was important that people speak with tongues and be filled with the Holy Ghost because he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, go back. If you'll go back, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. And we're not, this isn't part of Paul's journey. But the Bible says, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ. People giving heed to him, uh, both seeing and hearing the miracles which he wrought. And they talked about the lame, the main, being made whole, so forth. So on. And when Jerusalem, uh, when the disciples of Jerusalem had heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, might lay hands on them that they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. For he was yet, yet fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Right. So they received the word of God. They've been baptized. And they sent disciples down to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. Right. See, people, people just need to read your whole Bible. Yeah. Well, I got all the Holy Ghost you're ever going to get. And, well, apparently they did. You're special. Yeah. <laughs> because in the Bible, they didn't. <laughs> you're so special. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, anyway, praise God. Let's move right along. Isn't that right? Okay. And, um, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, uh, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when uh, divers were hardened, that means many, um, and believed not, but spake evil of the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And he, could spend, he continued by the space of two years, so that all they dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both 
Jews and Greeks. So Paul comes into Ephesus, has his same disciples, about three months here, and then he spends somewhere in the neighborhood of two years or so. So we're figuring he left Antioch, he got to Ephesus, uh, he left Antioch in 53. He may have gotten to Ephesus in the same year, 53. He spends about three months, and then he spends another two years. And so somewhere around 55 to 56. Now remember, some of our, our um, things about when Paul wrote books are, are it's just, you know, you could be off a year or two. We just, we don't know for sure. I mean, it's hard to get exact um, with, you know, the record keeping of the era. And so, so if you're off a year or two, <laughs> la-di-da. We have, we, 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 I went back and changed um, the First and Second Corinthians and everything to 55 to 57 A.D. Um, on, on the slideshow because it's, it's just, these are approximate dates, general time frame. But so, now while Paul is here in Ephesus, he does end up writing the letter, the first letter to the church at Corinth. And um, so, anyway, we'll, we'll get there. Don't know if we're going to get in there tonight. We might give an introduction to First Corinthians. Okay. Uh-huh. I better get back to the right chapter, hadn't I? Okay, verse 11. God, uh, verse 10. He continued by a space of two years so that all they that dwell in Asia. Now, that's a big area. I mean, he's in Ephesus preaching. Asia is this area down here at this time. Because see, here's, here's uh, uh, Galatia. Here is, where's Phrygia? Uh, here's Galatia. Here's Phrygia. This arena, if you look on some different maps, this area is Asia. Asia's a little bit bigger now, but back then that was Asia. Okay? That whole region here is about Jesus. I am telling you, the gospel is the, is the power of God unto salvation. Can you say amen? And we, we got to realize, I, I know America has become lethargic. America has become disconnected. America has become carnal. But I am telling you, the power of God is in his gospel. And we need to be teaching what the word of God says. And stop trying to convince people and trick people. We need to go in the power of the Lord and the Holy Ghost. Paul said in one place, he said, I came not unto you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man but in the power of God amen, amen. so we got this I'm telling you in the day we live in you can't be cute you might fill up a building with cute but you don't set the captives free with cute it's going to take the power of God and we're going to have to be committed as believers to walk in that authority and walk in that power and walk the ways we need to walk in order to have that authority and power working in us so we can get the job done because there's a world going to hell while we're being cute in the church. And we've got to stop. We've got to get busy about the things of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And so it says here, um, the all in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Man, I'm telling you, the power of God, <clears throat> this is a sign and wonder ministry. That's how it got all over the region. People get hungry for God. They get hungry for the super. Listen, people are hungry for supernatural. That's why they'll go watch movies like, I forgot what those movies where they, they, they film the uh, what, what, paranormal. Yeah. The paranormal movies. And they have all these, they're filming supposedly active demon spirits. I don't doubt it. People, things levitating and all kinds of stuff. Well, some all yeah. used to talk about it. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've never read his, his life story, and never uh, listen to him teach about the, 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 the demon-possessed girl in, in the Philippines. Yeah. That'll make the hair on the back of your neck. I heard him, I heard him tell in person a couple of times. Now, it'll make the hair, when, hearing, having him tell it in person, and to him it was just like it was real yesterday. He's a national, he became a national hero in the whole, in Philippines. Yeah. There's a church that started out of that that's still in existence today. Uh, his, his one of his sons passed it for a number of years. I'm telling you, when he talks about that demon possessed girls and the bite marks showing up on her body and, and pu her pulling hair out of the atmosphere, just right out of the air, and all the stuff that was going on there with the demon possession, and the, the Lord sent him to cast the devil out. When he showed up, he didn't know what to do. He left. <laughs> he, he had to go find out from God what to do. I mean, they, they would put her on the radio, and, and, they, and she'd be screaming and crying about these demons coming. She would disappear and leave the, leave the cell. And then the demon would bring her back. He 
You got goosebumps already? <laughs> but the, in that process, God taught him how to cast out devils. And to exercise his authority over that. He, set, he got her set free. And, to, and totally set free. And then he became a national hero. Because they played it all over the radio. If anybody can help this girl, please come. Anybody can help this girl, please come. He showed up kind of cocky and left. Well, what in the world am I going to do with that? <laughs> but later in his life, he talks about one time he was in his bed. And the bed lifted up, levitated, went across the room. He said, devil, put it down in Jesus' name. Let's dropped it. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. He said, wait, come back. Put it back where you found it. <laughs> so you don't have to be afraid of devils. Demons are afraid of me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Little Keith Moore there. Demons are afraid of me. They're afraid of you. They don't, that's why they want you, that's why, they want you, that's why they want you playing games. That's why they want you to be carnal. That's why you want your mind not renewed to the word of God. Why? Because they want you to not know your authority in Christ so you can exercise it over them and run roughshod over the kingdom of darkness. Glory to God. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And his body were brought handkerchiefs and aprons. And the diseases went out from them. And the evil spirits went out of them. I mean, they, look, he, Paul didn't even have to show up. They just took a handkerchief off of him and threw it on a demon-possessed person. And the devil went out. Why? Because the anointing of God's transferable. Her sham about one time these people bought him some candy. He said, I want you to pray over the candy. I ain't praying over no candy. <clears throat> He said, Brother Shabbat, we can't take claws in there. The, the, the insane asylums won't let you bring a cloth in because they know what you're doing. You can't go cast out devils in the insane asylum. You got demon-possessed doctors keeping people demon-possessed so they can make money off of it. He said, give me that candy. Didn't you like it? Here. He came back a couple weeks later with the, with the woman that was in the insane asylum. He said, I gave her the candy. As soon as she started eating it, the devil went out of her. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> oh, okay. brother Shambach, hallelujah. Anybody know how to remember the word, Hebrew word Shabbat means to shout? Shabbat Shambach, all right, hallelujah. If you never got to hear brother Shambach, well, anyway. Bro Buddy Harrison said of brother Shambach, he said he was the greatest preacher of faith, he, not teacher, but preacher of faith he ever heard. Hallelujah. Then, next, so here we are, some key events going on here. Uh, <clears throat> the Ephesians, on the second missionary journey, third missionary journey, the Ephesians get baptized in the Holy Ghost. He stays there about two years. Special miracles are wrought. Now we get down to this next one. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call of, over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. The name of Jesus only works for those who know their authority in God for believers. It does not work for unbelievers. It works for believers. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And the evil spirit answered. I probably, that probably shook him up a little bit. It probably hadn't had that happen before. And said, I love this, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I know Jesus. Because he done whipped us. I know Paul. Because he's been exercising authority over us. But who are you guys? I haven't run into you yet. <coughs> And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling at Ephesus, and fear came on all them. The name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many believed and came and confessed and showed their deeds. Now, um, there was about seven of them. It says about seven other sons. One man whipped seven guys because he had a demon. He had a demon. <laughs> I got to move over here. <laughs> so anyway, so seven sons of Sceva, they're going to go out there. They make money. They make money off of casting devils out. But they ran into one. Some guys possess one. They come in and say, oh, well, this, this Paul's been doing this in Jesus' name. We're going to try it. So you can't try what you don't know. And the name of Jesus belongs to the church, not to people doing exorcisms for money. It belongs to the believer. You see, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Them that what? Believe. 
And what happened here was God didn't even try to honor it because if he had honored it, it would have given uh, credence to their ability to cast out devils with the name of Jesus, whether they believed or not. And God won't have any part of that. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall cast out devils. The literal Greek says there, they shall exercise authority over. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and many of them which used curious arts brought their books together, burned them all before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it was 50,000 pieces of silver. These people were superstitious. They got books on curious arts. In other words, enchantments. Ouija board books. You know? Harry Potter books. I'm, I'm just, well, you know, teach your kids how to, how to cast spells. You know, be, be, be careful about stuff. Some things you can filter when you get older that you don't need to expose your children to when they're still developing in their, their, their consciousness of who God is and you're teaching and stuff. Teaching and putting stuff into them at certain ages could be dangerous. Amen? Now, maybe when you get older and your, your filters are better developed and you have more, maybe you can see something that won't affect you nearly as much as it was a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Just be wise. Parents, be wise. Be smart. You know? Don't, don't necessarily expose your children to stuff that, that you, doesn't affect you. you. You may not be a good filter for a four-year-old. Unless you can put yourself back in the place of a four-year-old. Yeah, and, and that four-year-old, whoever that is. Amen. You know, you might be able to listen to something and do something and, and not affect you. But now, listen, you can't just feed on it because it will affect you. But I, I'm saying, you know, uh, you might be able to watch Harry Potter as an adult. and not. You know, I mean, kids all love the werewolf and vampire thing. Please. You know, I, I asked my girls, I said, why do you have Team Edward and Team Jacob on your cars? You know, but you know, you don't need eight year old, little eight year olds or four year old girls into vampires. It's dangerous. There's some things that are dangerous. And here, this city, well, obviously, had gotten where it just became normal for them. They brought 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of books that were for curious arts and things outside the things of God and burned them. Listen to what it says next. What it says next, <laughs> if I can find what it says next. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, just so y'all know, I don't know anybody in the church who's doing Harry Potter or whatever. I don't know if you do or don't. I don't know what you're doing in your home. So if that came out and you think it was you, it was. There you go. <laughs> but it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, designed to get you. Hallelujah. Okay. And it says, after these things ended, Paul proposed the Spirit that when, when he passed over through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, um, I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered with him, Timotheus and Eratus, e e but he himself stayed behind in Asia for a season, so he hasn't left uh, there yet. And the same time there arose no small stir about the way. For, now this is, so he's, he's there. He sends T Timothy and his partner off to go check out what's going on over in, 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 uh, in um, Macedonia. So we got Macedonia. This is over here, which includes Corinth all the way up through this whole area. Remember, Paul had traveled on a second missionary through Philippi, down to Thessalonica, Berea, down to Athens. Of course, they go over to Macedonia, check things out. So understand, there's things Paul writes in letters I'll just look at the clock. Paul writes in letters because he sent people out to find out what's going on. And then he dealt with stuff. Because there's stuff going on. And so his, his need to keep the church on the right track, he had to deal with stuff. All right? Um, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, uh, brought no small gain um, unto the craftsmen. Now, that means he made a lot of money. Diana was the goddess. Let me think now. We've got Diana was a goddess of uh, fertility. Okay? They worshiped the goddess of fertility. 
You go look up on the internet and see how she was made. All right? <clears throat> Whom he called together with the worksmen like of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. In other words, they're making a lot of money off of making little Diana statues so people can put them on their mantles and their fireplaces. All right? Moreover, you see here, not, on that, uh, not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all of Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people saying that they have no go- that there be no gods which are made with hands. Well, they knew that. But they were all what they care about. Greedy for filthy lucre. And let me tell you something. You don't have to be making goddess Diana goddesses to be greedy for filthy lucre. You can have doctrine goddesses that you're greedy for filthy lucre over. That's why we have to keep a right heart about things in the church. We have to know it's about helping people grow and be established in the faith and not in making our ministers. You can't be about making yourself rich. See, that's what Dad Hagen uh, said to all the prosperity preachers back before he went home to be with the Lord. Back about 1999 or 2000, he, he had a big meeting with all of them. He says, you know, look, the excess of prosperity killed the move of God in the late 50s. I'm, I'm determined not to let it happen again, but it did. They, they just, just, a lot of them disrespected what he had, dis, disregarded what he had, went out and kept doing it. And I am telling you, it put the church into a law and opened the door for some other things to come in because they wouldn't, they wouldn't adhere to the one they all were calling their spiritual father until he corrected them. It's amazing how, you, how quickly you find out where people are when they get corrected like that. And he got correct. They, he came and called them all and corrected. Some of them got mad and walked out. Some of them, just, some of them wouldn't even come. I know one minister that wouldn't even come. But he built his whole ministry on going around acting like Brother Hagin. Right, y'all know who my spiritual father is. Everybody's having him in the churches because he's, you know. Then when Dad said, I, you got to come to my meeting, he wouldn't go. Mm-hmm. He's, either he's your dad, he's not. He's either your spiritual father. You have many teachers, but not many fathers. And, and see, the excess of prosperity, we got, that's why, you know, brother, the Lord told Brother Hagin something. I, I know we're, we're digressing a little bit. He told him to watch out for the three G's. Amen? The glory, the gold, <laughs> and the girls. All three of them will get you in trouble. Amen? You know, in other words, being so full of pride, it's all about you and, you, and making you feel good and establishing you in front of everybody, and you've got your own, the glory. Then you do things, and you won't preach the whole truth because it'll run people off, and you won't get all your money, or you're, you're, you're only sharing a certain truth that'll get you money, the gold. Watch out for the gold. And you always got to watch out for the girls, men. You just got to watch out for them. Because let me tell you something. I've heard, ministers, I've heard pastors say this. I said, they'll, they'll go, and they'll call all the hotels for these traveling ministers. And they'll find out where they're staying. And somehow or another get the room number and go up and knock on their doors. And offer themselves to them. I was in your meeting tonight. Start singing hot stuff. Well, I've got to say something. Billy Graham made a covenant with those men who traveled him all those years. That they would always keep themselves pure and undefiled, particularly in the arena of, of, of uh, their relationship with their wives and keeping themselves pure from stuff. And they just make sure they had each other's back all those years. Amen. We need that kind of integrity in every circle of the church. You've got, you've got, to, make, you've got to be in covenant. You've got to make sure that you're guarding yourself. Because the devil will, and he won't send no ugly woman up to your room. Are you here? You've gone home. It won't be something you go, my God, woman, go put up. Just, just go lay down face down in the water. He won't send one of them up to your room. He'll send, he'll send you know, hot mama. And I have not experienced this. Thank God. And praise God. I don't travel enough to, to have that situation. Are you here? But I'm telling you, the devil's evil. How did I get off on that? 
Uh, all right. Well, anyway, it was good. Let's go back to Diana. Got off on that somehow with Diana, you know. But yeah, got the God. I got off on the money. and started talking about gold, glory, and girls. I can tell you that if you get off in one of those areas, it's easy to get off in all the others too. Pride comes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before it fall. You start taking your glory to yourself, you get lifted up in pride, you're opening your doors to all the other stuff too. Mm -hmm. This isn't just as a, as a minister, this is as a believer. You know, you just, we, we just got to keep ourselves right before the Lord. I said, we got to keep ourselves right before the Lord. Keep our hearts pure. Keep our hearts right. Keep a right attitude. Make sure we're honoring the Lord in everything we do. Hallelujah. Uh, now, what happens here? Think about this now. Not long before this, we, we find out special miracles are going all over Asia. Anchors have been taken out. Aphids are going out. Demons are coming out. People are getting healed. Now, all of a sudden, the, the, all of a sudden the silversmiths in Ephesus get upset. Mm -hmm. now we stirred up some devils. You can stir up some devils. Amen? Now, a lot of times we won't stir them up if we'll compromise. They'll let, well, look, he's going to compromise. We're going to let him leave because at least, at least what he's doing is not going to be injurious to what we're doing and strategizing. They don't know who they are in Christ. We'll take them out when, they, when he leaves. See? Now, I can be honest with you. One of, the, one of the most important things to me is that you grow in your understanding of who you are in Christ, understand your authority, understand the things you need to do so that, that you don't short-circuit that flow of the Holy Ghost in your life by, by getting convinced it's okay, you know, to, to run around with women. You can't run around with women. Even if you're unmarried, you can't run around with women. Or men. If you're a man, ever. Women can't run around women anyway. We said Sunday how goofed up devils get. I told you about the two, the two couples that got married in Texas that one partner of each couple was born a man had gender reassignment. Any, whatever you want to call it. And then, listen to how stupid this is. Went and found a woman and so they're quote lesbian couples getting married. But by law, the chromosomes are man, so they're not, they're, he's still, they're still men. So it's not, it's not lesbian couples getting married. It's a man marrying a woman by law because the chromosomes are man and female. But how goofed up is it to become a woman so you can marry a woman? I'm telling you, the, the devil's messed up. I said the devil is messed up. And he will mess you up if you let him. I don't want to get messed up. You want to get messed up? I want to be casting devils out, not inviting them home. We don't want to, I don't want to show them in my house. I want to cast them out. All right. So they, they, they be no gods which are made by hands. So that not only this our crash is in danger, as we said it not, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And listen, I'm going to tell you, you're going to stir, when you start stirring devils up, they're going to try to stake out their ground. But that's okay. I said, that's okay. Because we had disciples there. Letters were written there. It was an important trade route. It was an important place where the gospel got sent out from. And the whole city was filled with confusion, having called uh, Gaius and Articus, Ar Articus, a man of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. They rushed from one accord into the theater, and when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered or allowed or not, and certain of the chief of, a chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not venture himself into the theater. Some therefore uh, cried one thing and some another, and for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were coming together. In other words, most people didn't know why they were there. They just came. What's he running for? I don't know. He's following. <clears throat> so the biggest group of people showed up there. Don't even know why they're there. Because people will follow people. I guarantee if you went and got in the military and, and, and just ran out, ah, ah, something, something, there's something wrong. And then, he, then you have to cry fire. Just say something's wrong. People start, jump up and start running out with you. What's wrong? What's wrong? I don't know, but I'm leaving. All right. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude of the Jews, putting him forward. And Alexander, 
uh, beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew with all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. See, the Jews are behind part of this. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of Ephesus, of the Ephesians, is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches or blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there, is de there are deputies, let them implead, and, and plead one another. But if you're inquiring anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar by the Romans. Remember that these different providences, even though they were, they were independent, they were under Roman authority. And so if they did something outside, the Romans would come in and crack down on it. You, know, you, can't, you guys can't behave, boom! They come in and crack down on it. Uh, whereby I give an account of um, this, this concourse. And when they had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul calling him to the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. Okay, so here we are. This is where we're going to have to stop because next week we're going to pick up with 1 Corinthians. All right? So Paul's getting ready to go to Macedonia. But while he's, before he leaves Corinth, while he's at Corinth, um, he, remember he's there a couple, not Corinth, Ephesus, he's there for about two years. He writes 1 Corinthians. Now, remember, he sent Timothy and those guys over there. At some point in time, the information has come back, what's going on in Corinth. Now, Corinth is, is just a lewd city. It's just lewd. They are, they're, they're perversion, they're perverse in, in things. I mean, remember Paul writes that you know, the things that are going on in your church don't even happen among the Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. S sexual liberty was, was a big thing to them. <laughs> Where are we living today? Sexual liberty, you know. Uh, we can do whatever we want to do, and it doesn't matter. And uh, Paul, Paul even said, he said, this thing isn't even mentioned among the Gentiles. In other words, you're doing it in the church, and the Gentiles don't even do this. Bunch of perverts. <laughs> I can hear Paul. I, I'm sure Paul probably had some things to say in his breath that he didn't write. Well, you know, because have you ever seen some of Paul's writing? Remember, remember I wrote, I told you out of... Um, uh, J.B. Phillips, when he wrote to the church at Galatia, he said, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. That's what, that's what J.B. Phillips said, how he translated, you know, oh, you foolish Galatians. He said, oh, you dear idiots. I'm sure Paul, you know, whatever language he could use of the day to, 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 to uh, lay out the fact they were stupid. All right? Let me read this to you, and then we're going we're gonna to go. So next week, we're going to get into 1 Corinthians. Paul, before Paul gets over to Macedonia, he writes 1 Corinthians, Okay? Um, leaving Antioch on his first ministry's journey, Paul passed through uh, Phrygia and Galatia, came to Ephesus where he remained over two years. It's a much longer time than he spent in any other city on these journeys. It was during this time that reports reached the apostle concerning the moral and spiritual state of the things in the uh, Corinthian church. There was, was an occasion of writing this letter. There were many things to, at work that hindered the power and progress of the gospel in Corinth. Let me say this. Why did Paul correct the church? Because it was inhibiting the power and the flow of God, which would do what? It would inhibit people coming to the kingdom. Now I say, ministers live by a higher standard because we can't be engaged in things that are going to hurt the church and be passed on to the church and then keep people away from the kingdom. That's why, that's why you've got to be careful about money, ministers. You've got to be careful about the glory. Well, I've got a right to have this, and I've got a right to have that. That's not the question. The question is, what, how is it going to be perceived in the world if you're living in lasciviousness? Now, listen, I know in certain churches, you know, that the pastor's like a god. Now, I'll be honest with you, somebody, somebody told me this that, that knows. There's one church, and it's a local church, that there are women in church. They believe that they're called of God to take care of the pastor's needs. Sex. That they are spiritual handmaidens. Let me tell you something. Ain't no such animal. It's called sin. They're going to go in there and take care of the pastor's needs. So he can, you can't minister. 
Hey, how are you going to minister to a woman in your congregation? <laughs> how can I say this in a nice way? You've been, you've been banging in the office. That's as nice as I can come up with. <laughs> okay. How are you going to do that? How are you going to lay hands on her and get her healed? When we all you think about when you lay hands on her is something else. That's the craziest mess I ever heard. <clears throat> are you here? You're going home. The moral state of a congregation can either inhibit or allow the flow of God to work. That's why it's important that we have the right things going on and we keep ourselves pure and undefiled. Amen. Paul wrote to Timothy, his young pastor, he said, flee fornication because he apparently wasn't married. He said, flee it. He didn't say embrace it. Run! <laughs> Pull a Joseph, baby! Get out of there! All right. Um, as indicated by the... Uh, the, the, the <coughs> okay. Paul had come from Corinth to Athens, remained there 18 months. He began his labors by preaching in the synagogue, but then was driven out of it and compelled to give his instruction in the home of justice. During this day, he founded the church at Corinth and wrote, this, and wrote the epistles to the Thessalonians, which we just covered, which were his first epistles. Okay. Um, while in Ephesus, he received news of a distressing nature relative to the state of things at this church. In other words, can you understand that the care of the pastor and the overseer of the people of God is not a lightly taken thing? Paul's distressed in his spirit when he hears what's going on in his church that he started. He becomes distressed. Man, I left you guys with the, I taught you the truth. I preached Jesus. And then you got this man living with his stepmama sitting in the church acting like it's okay. And then there's, um, there's more stuff than that going on. They're getting drunk and everything else. At the Lord's table. Coming in in, the, in church. Getting drunk in church. Well, I don't guess it's any worse than having sex in the pastor's office with another woman. Um. It was divided, the part, the, remember, it was divided into a party spirit. Well, I'm a Paul, I'm of a Paul, so I'm of, I'm of Peter, Cephas. And um, immoralities of various kinds prevailed in the church. There were those who wouldn't partake of the Lord's Supper, then eat meat offered to idols. There were irregularities in public worship and mistaken views of the resurrection. There were some of the, these are some of the things in this epistle that uh, was designed to correct. Clement of Rome in his epistle to the church referred to Paul's epistle. It was written out in other words, you know, in other words, he wrote a letter later, but it, it was not considered canon. Um, it was written some Ephesus 57, 58, and not from Philippi as it is mistakenly given by the superscription and the author in the King James Version. Uh, attention is called to the outline of this epistle and also chart preceding the epistle, giving the four doctrinal epistles. Okay. So we have here Paul's over in Ephesus. He gets word of what's taking place over in Corinth, and he writes him a letter. And I like this. When you get together next time, I'll be there in spirit, and I've judged the thing already. I'm turning that guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, is that not love? Because for him to be destroyed in his flesh and come to repentance is better than going to hell. I think. Just my opinion. Anybody else's opinion? Man, I'll, I'll, I'll take boils over hell any day. <laughs> Just saying. You, know, you, you can repent and get healed. The other is forever. All right. So, today we leave Paul at Ephesus. Next week we'll, we'll, he'll write his letter. I don't think we're going through it in one service. It's the second longest of his letters. Romans is his longest. Okay. And then he gets over to Macedonia. He's there three months and writes another letter. All right? Hallelujah. Y'all enjoying this? Yeah. Now we got, so we got all the background. It, it really helps when you understand why things were written. It really does. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, when you know Paul's in Ephesus, he gets word there's some junk going on in the church, and he writes over there. Now, guys, <laughs> this ain't what I taught you. But you know, also, he writes in there, 
you come behind a no gift. Why do you build me up, build me up, Brother Paul? Just to slap me down, slap me down. <laughs> All right, I'm just messing now. All right.